This is the second video for Chapter 4, Logical Design. And um, we're starting here with slide 10. That's where we left off in the chapter. But um, before we continue with uh, Logical Design and ERDs, uh, the book has a, little, a couple slides here about naming conventions that they use in the book. Uh, when you're and they're talking about naming entities and naming uh, attributes, primary keys, things like that. It says it's crucial for good design. That's true, and you should be consistent in the way you name your database objects. Um, usually, you don't, as a single programmer or analyst, you don't worry too much about this, other than you just follow the standards and guidelines that the company that you're working for has set for. So this is, you know, a naming convention is usually isn't something you have to come up with on your own. Uh, the naming conventions they use in the book it says the entities, and then when they become tables, are named single nouns, like a student or a tutor or an employee. Uh, some companies use a plural. It's not that big a deal. It says you want to be consistent. Attributes, in other words, the field names then within the entities. They start, sometimes there's a, some companies use a standard where they use the entity name followed by the attribute name, such as if you have the last name in the tutor entity, it's called tutor last name. Or if you have a last name for student, it's called student last name. Again, this is, as long as you're standardized and uh, consistent, that's fine. Here's right what I don't like, uh, what the book does here, but it's okay. They, they, they can do what they want. But the primary keys, they end their primary key fields with the word key. I guess that's fine. But uh, usually what we've seen in uh, you know, the databases we use in Access, like the primary key usually ends with the word ID or number. For instance, a student table. They're, in the book, they're going to call the primary key student key instead of student ID or student number. That would be the same with, like, if you had an um, order entity or an order table. Instead of order ID or order number, the book would call that order key. I just don't like the word or that convention, but that's okay. And then it says the foreign key retains the same name as the primary key. And that is a good idea. You'll see some uh, databases don't do that. Their foreign key, they change the name a little bit, and I think it's confusing. I believe that the foreign key should retain the name of the primary key. Remember, that's the field that links the two tables together to form a relationship. Okay, so let's keep going here. This is a really good table here. Uh, or, excuse me, not table. It's, it's just a chart, I guess I would call it. Now, remember when we started this class, we were basically looking at an existing database in Access. So we use the term such as table. That's where the data is. Inside of a table, of course, it's made up of fields and uh, records and fields. Some people use the word columns and rows. That's fine, too. Either one, you can see they all mean the same thing here in physical design. I said we took a step back into logical design. So this is before the database exists. When we're in logical design, we refer to the table as an entity. Remember, an entity is a thing that we're going to keep and store information about. And then well, the word for field is attribute. OK, so attribute. Those are the terms that we typically use in the logical design stage. Once we have our logical design completed, and we go create that physically in a database, then entities become tables, attributes become fields, and then when we add data into the table, you know, we're adding rows or records of data. Over here on the right side, you see the theoretical names. Uh, typically, you um, see these used in um, uh, theoretical type database classes, say at a four-year university. You don't typically on the job hear people using these terms too much. Maybe attribute. Again, that's the same as a field or a column. 
but relation, some people might refer to a table as a relation, but I guess I never do, but uh, theoretically you could refer to it. And then the theoretical term for a record or a row is a tuple or a tuple, some people pronounce. And you hardly ever hear that in the real world. It's usually typically, a, again, a theoretical type of term. Okay, so here's a, uh, a phenomenon when you're designing tables or entities in the logical design. It says you may um, come up and you're starting um, to list or number attributes. So let's take this example over here. They're keeping track of all the tutors at a school. So their primary key, they're going to assign a tutor ID. I guess that's similar to a student. They got their last name, first name. Whoops, let me go back. They got their last name, first name, phone, email, hire date. And then they're going to list the courses that that tutor is able to tutor in. So they say, well, we, a tutor could, could tutor in more than one course. So they start to list or number these attributes. Usually when you see that, that's a warning sign. And that's called a repeating field. You don't want that in your database. It's tempting to do that, but let's say a tutor, one tutor did tutor in three courses, so it might work for them, but wonder if they only tutored in one course. Then they would have two fields here that are null or blank. They'd be wasting space. Or wonder if a tutor was able to tutor in ten courses. Would they then add seven more attributes here? That's not a good idea when you see this numbering. So what you do, it says numbering attributes is always a mistake. Well, it is. It just it leads to a lot of bad design in your, your tables. It says that you should split it up. It's really a one-to-many relationship. You have your tutor information here in the tutor entity. And then you have your course information here. Okay. And then you would create another a relationship to show the relationship between the tutor and the uh, courses. And what we're coming to I think a better example of that. But we're going to go to through, first. We're going to go through three types of relationships between entities. We've seen a lot of one-to-many's. That's the most common. There are such things as one-to-one -one relationships, and then there's many-to-many -many relationships. Many-to-many -many can only exist in the logical design stage. If we want to continue and implement this as a real physical database, we have to break them apart. And we'll do that in my last video, third one. Okay, the one-to-one -one relationship means for every relationship in the primary table, there's one related record in the foreign key table. Here's the crow's feet notation for it. You can have a zero or one relationship or an exactly one-to-one. -one. A zero to one just means that they're not there doesn't necessarily have to be a related record in the foreign key or the child side. That's the only difference there. Uh, it says one to ones are rare. That's true, and there's two main reasons why you would use one to one. One of the reasons is to get rid of null entities. Okay, so that's one reason, and the other reason is for security some examples of this in the next couple slides. Here's where you might uh, prevent or use one-to-one -one relationship to prevent nulls. This is the example the book gives, but I just want to, I'll use my own example and let you read about this one in the text, but my example would be, let's say you have customers. You have a customer table or a customer entity, and some customers or all customers would have their address information. So address one, address two, city, state, zip. Well, some customers want and have a different shipping address. So you could add several fields. Uh, shipping address, uh, shipping city, shipping state, shipping zip. But let's say only 10% of your customers really used a different shipping address. Most of them just use their regular address. That means in 90% of the records in that customer database, those special shipping um, records would, uh, or ship, special shipping attribute fields would 
be null. So you might create two, another table, one just called customer shipping info and have a one-to-one -one relationship there. So that's another example. Again, you could read the book book's example here with uh, library resources that also shows and it demonstrates why you would use a one-to-one -to, -one to prevent nulls. And they do show you the data and all that good stuff here. The other reason for security reasons, let's say you, it's pretty common to have an employee entity, you know, you'd have all the employee information. <laughs> they don't really show much here, but remember this is just an example. Of course you would have an employee first name, last name, employee address, and all, all that good stuff. You'd have probably dozens of different attributes here. But let's say you have, some of the employee information is private, or it's they want it secure. So they break that, all those, into a separate entity, like social security address and their salary, and just form a one-to-one -one relationship. Notice how the key, the primary key field of these one-to-one -one relationships are the same field. So they're saying here that each employee has a matching record, you know, one and only one record matching over here in the private employee entity. And each one of these records refers back to one and only one employee. So this is a good example of one-to-one -one for security. The reason they say for security is because you could give someone access to this employee table now just to look at it and they can't see the employee's private data. Only people who are required to see that or authorized to see the, the private data for the employee, such as maybe a manager or the HR department or someone like that, they would give, be given access to this particular entity to look at also. Whereas just maybe a regular employee only needs to maybe see some of this other information about the employee. Uh, this isn't, you know, I, I'm not, this is used occasionally. There are other ways that you can do this for security. For instance, you could have all the employee attributes over here and then just create a query and only include the fields that you want someone to see and then just give people access to that query. So there's other ways um, to do this. I would say typically in most databases, all the fields or all the attributes are just in one employee table. But this might be a reason that you could use a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, the most common relationship, one-to-many. We've seen a lot of these, like a customer can have many orders, and each order goes back to one customer. That's a one-to-many. And there's just a lot of examples we saw in the access databases. There's two um, crow's feet notation. Again, they're very similar. The only difference is this zero. All that means is, let's say customer entity was over here and orders was over here. All this, the only difference is here, a customer at a minimum might not have any orders. So you could have a custom record with no orders for that customer in there. The bottom one says a customer, each customer has at least one order and at the most many orders. Many just means more than one. Okay. So that's a one to many. There's the crow's feet notation. Here's a good example of a one to many. You have a department entity. Each department has at least one and probably many employees. That would be a common situation at most companies. An employee, however, might not be in any department, or they could be in a maximum of one. You know, how could they not be in a department? Well, see this department key field? That's the foreign key, right? That relates these two entities. This is not a required field. Notice it's not in bold. That means when you enter an employee's data here, you put in their first name, last name, and probably a whole bunch of other attributes. That's not showing here. And then in the department key, since it's not a required field, that employee might not be part of a department. Maybe they're a temporary employee. Maybe uh, they're in uh, executive level management and not, they don't really have a department. So that's why that is a uh, not a required field. Therefore, this minimum cardinality becomes zero. If your company says, hey, each employee, 
we for sure they are in a department. So they would require this field to be filled in. This would become a one right here. This zero minimum cardinality would become a one. Minimum cardinality just refers to the minimum number of records that are related to each record in one table. So at a minimum cardinality for a department, they're saying a minimum, the department has to have at least one employee. An employee and a minimum here has to be in zero departments. And again, that's this is either a zero or one, and it's all depending upon whether this foreign key is a required field or not. If it's not required, then the minimum is zero. If it's required, then the minimum is one. Here's the data that kind of just kind of demonstrates that relationship we just looked at with departments and employees. A cross relationship error, um, you might say, well, why don't I just put the, instead of putting the employee key, or excuse me, instead of just putting the department key here in the employee table, why don't I put the employee, whoops, I go back again. Why don't we put the employee key over here in the department? So they get this, what's called a cross-relationship error. Um, it says it's, it wouldn't be easy to enter data here. Um, it just wouldn't work really well. Mainly a department that has many employees, there's only one field here to show that. You want the foreign key on the many side. That's kind of what it boils down to here. So this bottom one is not good. This top one is the way it should be, this top. The foreign key over here on the many side. In this case, that department is the parent table. The employee is the child table. Because it's the many side of the relationship. Okay, that's the end of this particular video. I'm going to one third video that covers the rest of the chat.